Good morning. Jody usually does that with a running start. I didn't, I'm not as uh, adept at this whole welcome timing thing as he is. It's great to see you this morning. Welcome to Twickenham. It's good to have everybody here. If you are visiting with us, uh, a special welcome to you, and we thank you for being here. Um, we know there are a lot of things that you could be doing on a Sunday morning, and so we are honored that you have chosen to be a part of our assembly here. There is a card on the back of the seat that's probably in front of you. If you would please take one of those cards, there is a portion there that our members can fill out. And for visitors, if you would fill out a card for us, we would just like to know that you were here. Uh, and we would appreciate you doing that. You can drop that in the collection plate when it comes by in just a few minutes. There is also uh, a place there where you can identify any prayer requests that you have, and we would encourage you to do that. We will pray throughout this week for those requests that we collect today. So if there is something that we can join you in prayer about, we would be honored to do that. And if it's something that you would not mind us making public, we'll share that with the larger group. If it's something that's private, we'll just ask our staff and our, our shepherds to pray over that. But we would like to join you in that if you would like to afford yourself with that opportunity. I want to say uh, a couple of things about a process that we are undertaking here as a congregation, as a church family. And that is considering the possibility of, a, of adding some elders or what we call shepherds uh, to our leadership team here. Uh, there have been some announcements that have gone out via email and have been announced from, from the podium up here a few times, but I just want to remind you that that process is ongoing. We're going to continue to take those nominations uh, for folks that you think should be considered for that through July 9th, so we're down to about two weeks of, uh, of doing that. To this point, we have not received a lot of those, but uh, I know that as a church, uh, sometimes I know what the deadline is, and, and I wait till pretty close to the deadline. So you may be like I am and, and waiting to do that. I would encourage you to, to do that. There are a few things that may help in that process I just want to bring to your attention. The first is, would you be in prayer about that? Uh, even if you are not submitting names, we just ask that you would continue to pray for the leadership of this church, that God would grant us wisdom and grace as we go through this process, and that you would pray for those who may be asked to step into that leadership position, that God would call the people that he wants to be a part of our leadership team and that they would have a heart that would be receptive to that. Would you pray through that process with us? You can also uh, get some additional information about the process that we're going through and about uh, elders and shepherds that we'll be adding. And there are some ways that you can do that. One is there is a Twickenham newsletter that goes out uh, that just went out this past week. If you have an email account, you probably received that. If you have not, there are some hard copies that are available here. And there are a couple of articles in there that are specific to this process that I think would be worth your while to read. So please take a look at those and read through those. Also, uh, Jody is going to be speaking to us for the next two weeks about uh, godly leadership and about shepherds, elders. Uh, and so be attentive to that as you go through and as you pray. And then the last thing I would ask you to do is pick up one of the forms that you'll find out in the lobbies uh, that are the nomination forms. And, and there's some instructions in there of how you can fill those out to nominate men to that position. There are also, uh, there's a a good number of, of scripture references that are on there that would be great to go through and to review as you go through that process. So just want to emphasize that this morning, ask you please to join us in that and to be in prayer as we go through that. Um, I want to lead us in prayer as we get ready to start into our worship. Uh, and as we do that, would you stand? Father, we just thank you for uh, the beauty of this morning and for the opportunity to be here together as brothers and sisters uh, to lift up your holy name and to worship you. And Father, as we do that, um, we just pray that you would open our hearts, that for those of us that are hurting, uh, that Father, you would speak to us and that you would remind us of your immense love and grace and mercy that you've extended to us. And I pray that you'd bring comfort. And Father, as we worship you this morning, we pray that you would hear our praise and that it would be a sweet aroma to you 
as we acknowledge that you are our creator and our sustainer and that, Father, you love us and you have saved us. And so we celebrate that this morning as we, as we uh, worship together in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn to some of the folks around you and say hello while we get ready to uh, continue our worship? Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive. Oh. 
pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Let's take our offering. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah. 
Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit to the work of earth is done. Jesus, my I think one of the most challenging aspects of being a Christian is attempting to understand God's perspective. He's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, amazingly creative, and eternal. Whereas we are mortal and materialistic, and we're bound to this time and space. You know, God sent his son to show us the Father. And though through that we have a much better grasp of the nature of God, we still can't maintain his perspective. In Colossians 2, we get a view of how radical and different God's perspective can be from the world's. Consider Jesus was beaten, stripped naked, put upon a cross between two criminals, and mocked with a crown of thorns and a sign that said, here's the king of the Jews. You know, the reason for crucifixion was to show the Romans' power and making a spectacle of and humiliating the person on the cross. And then we read Colossians 2, 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. That makes no sense to the world. It's hard to even grasp that understanding. Is With the cross, God says he disarmed his enemies, made a spectacle of them, and triumphed. What a different perspective than those that were standing at the foot of the cross that day. It's turned upside down. It has to make us think much deeper about how we view suffering and other problems in the world and how we end up view individuals and their value. But God did not stop with simply showing us this radical perspective. Let me read Romans 1 through 8. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because though Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit 
who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in, according to, in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is dead, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. God understands our limitations. Even though he sent the Son, he understands and he provides us the Spirit to help lead and support us. Accepting the Spirit and allowing him to lead us is crucial to gaining, maintaining God's perspective and living a life worthy of him. You know, we're constantly bombarded by the world's perspective every day. This morning's communion is a reminder of God's perspective, the triumph of the cross, and the Spirit who helps us in our walk. Would you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning acknowledging that we can't grasp you. We cannot fully understand your nature, your perspective, but we ask for your help, and we know you'll give it. You sent your only son to die on the cross to show us what you're willing to give for us, the va our value to you. And we're grateful for that. And we thank you for the communion that you gave us to remind us uh, in this world that there's more to it than this. We're grateful for this bread that represents the body that he so willingly gave up and you were willing to send. Help us to be mindful of that. In Christ's name, amen.
Father, we're so grateful for this fruit of the vine that represents God, your son's blood that he shed. And Father, help us. This is to remind us not just of what he did, but what we should be doing. We're so grateful for the spirit that you've given us. And I just pray that you'll pour it out on us to help us to do better every day at remembering Jesus and showing Jesus to those around us. Christ, let me pray. Amen. be Speak. 
Let's stand. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, oh comforter and friend, how we need your touch again, Holy Spirit, rain more terrifying than the song we just sang. The only thing more terrifying than for human beings than your spirit raining down on us and you doing with us what you will is that you would take your spirit away and that we would do what we want and not what you want. And so we echo in this prayer the prayer we just sang, that you would pour out your spirit on this church, over this church, through it, in us, and that we would have the courage and the humility to walk in step with your spirit, to live and to love and to serve and to give by your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. So if uh, you can look in First uh, Samuel, the book of First Samuel, God, it's a terrifying song. Terrifying song. If you really want the Holy Spirit to rain down, woohoo! People will say you're weird. Yes, they already say that about us anyway. So right, First Samuel 16 is where we're going to be. First Samuel 16. It's in the Old Testament, um, early on in the Old Testament, and we're going to be in. in uh, chapter 16. There's a story. Uh, All morning long, an instructor had been explaining leadership to a class of police recruits. Calling a recruit to the front of the class, he he gave the, the young police officer a piece of paper on which was written these words, you are in charge. Get everyone out of the room as quickly as possible without causing a panic. And the recruit looked at the words on the page and just froze. Couldn't think of a single thing to say. And so went and sat down. Then a second young recruit was called up to the front and handed the note, read the note, and said, okay, I'm in charge now. Everybody out. Go. Go. 
And nobody moved. Nobody moved. So a third recruit was called up, glanced at the instructions, smiled and said, okay guys, break for lunch. And everybody left. <laughs> Immediately. Room emptied in seconds. That, that little story illustrates the why leadership is so important. Some leaders freeze, and so you're stuck with the status quo. Some leaders lean only on authority. I've heard that if you have to announce your authority, you probably don't have any. And then some leaders just know what needs to be done and know how to motivate people to step up and do it, like that third recruit. As Todd said this morning when we began, we're entering into a season of, of great opportunity for our church as we consider appointing some new men to our eldership. Um, both online and in the lobbies, there are uh, forms, nomination forms that come complete with instructions on how to walk through this process. And so it's a good time for us to think about what leadership looks like and to seek God's guidance on the matter of leadership. It's, it's impossible to overstate how important this season of searching is for our church. The church staff will come and go. Well, most of us will come and go. Some of us just come and stay, right? But um, our shepherds, our elders are going to be with us for a very, very long time. Now, if you're a, a guest today, this is kind of like, well, this is one of those, that's not really what I had in mind when I came to church this morning. It's actually a, a, a pretty good time for you to visit, because if you're thinking about making Twickenham your church home, or if you're looking for a church home, I would think that one of the things you'd want to know about is lead, what, what do they think about leadership? How are they governed? How are, how are they organized? What's their model of church governance? So we're, we'll talk a little bit about some of that this morning from a biblical perspective. By the way, if you're um, a new member or thinking about Twickenham, we have a lunch today right after service for, uh, for our new members and folks that just kind of want to come kick the tires. So if you're visiting today, you'd like to learn a little more about us one-on-one, -on -one, our uh, elders will be there, our staff will be there, and we'll have lunch catered in, and we can, you can ask whatever questions you want, and we'll answer whatever questions we know the answer to. But it'd be a good time for you to join us. If you hadn't planned on that, please do so. One of the things that I think it's important for everybody to know is that the, the way that we are structured here at Twickenham, and a lot of churches, the preacher is like the boss, right? That's not how it is here. We, we have a, a staff, and I'm on staff, and Lincoln is our executive minister, and Steve Krieger is our associate minister, and uh, Amy is our children's minister. Our youth, we have two new youth ministers coming in. Caleb and Ashley Gendron are going to be joining us in a couple of weeks. In fact, they'll be here tomorrow uh, to be with our staff and to go to all our staff meetings, at which time they'll realize what a horrendous mistake they've made. But uh, other than that, that's, a, that's our staff. Our elders are a group of nine brothers. Uh, three of them were involved in, this, in leading the service this morning. Uh, and uh, they are the shepherds of our church, the overseers of our church. Uh, they are our guides. They are our leaders. So we'll, that's what we'll be talking about this morning, kind of what that's supposed to look like and what Scripture teaches about leadership. So if you're, if you're visiting, pretty good day to be here as we look at some of this stuff. So uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, let me set this up for you. Israel needs a new leader. The prophet Samuel is on his way to Bethlehem to the home of a man named Jesse. And he's going to look at Jesse's, one of Jesse's sons is supposed to be the new king of Israel. God's told him that much, but he doesn't, Samuel doesn't know which one of Jesse's sons it is. And so we pick it up in, in uh, 1 Samuel 16, verse 6, and we'll read down to the end of uh, verse 13. When they arrived, that Samuel and his retinue arrived at the home of Jesse, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, it's my favorite verse in the whole Bible, do not consider his appearance or his height. I love that. Doesn't matter what you look like or how tall you are. Amen. For I have rejected him. 
The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel, and Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah, this is the third son, pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen any of these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives, which had to be one of the most awkward moments ever. Because you, you, if you're one of the brothers, you've passed by Samuel, and Samuel has said, it's not you, it's not you, it's not you. And so you all have to kind of stand around there looking at your shoes while you wait for David, the baby, to come. And so he does. Then the Lord said, rise, this is verse uh, 12, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Two really important lessons here in this story. When, and, and Steve really talked about this in the communion meditation a moment ago. When they were looking for leadership, God's people needed God's perspective. Samuel thought Jesse's oldest son, Eliab, was the right man for the job. God disagreed. Each time one of Jesse's sons stood before him, Samuel thought, this has got to be the one. And yet each time God disagreed, not until David, the youngest, stood before Samuel did God say, there's your man. The text tells us why. Verse 7, don't, don't look at his appearance, don't look at his height. I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't look at the things people look at. God's got a different perspective. We, we look at the outside, God looks at the inside. If we're going to appoint the kind of leaders that we need or add the kind of leaders that we need to this church, we need God's perspective. So I hope you'll be in prayer every day, multiple times through the day, to ask God to give us his insight and his guidance. He has blessed us with a great group of leaders so far. They need some help. So pray for God. God's perspective as you think about this. And then second, the story teaches us that nobody can lead God's people without God's spirit, which is what we've been singing about all morning long, right? The spirit. Verse 13, from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. The very next verse, and we didn't read this one, but the next verse says, now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. Without God's Holy Spirit, no human being can effectively, faithfully lead God's people. Here's why. In the book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, verse 13, uh, chapter 13, Paul looked back on this story. The apostle Paul looked back on the story that we just read. He said, after removing Saul, God made David their king. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart. Here it is. He will do everything I want him to do. Those who lead God's people need God's spirit so that they will do what God wants them to do, not what you and I want them to do. Okay, I want, really want you to hear that. Leaders in, in the church need God's spirit so that they will do what God wants them to do, not what you or I want them to do, not even what they themselves want to do but what God wants them to do. And you need to know up front. I need to know this up front. When a leader does what God wants him to do, it is not always going to be agreeable to you or me. So as we look for leaders, we have got to have God's perspective. And the leaders need God's spirit. Now the Bible has a lot more to say about leadership in the church. It explains not only the qualities that we should uh, find in a leader, and we're going to look at those next week, but it also defines the work leaders are supposed to do. The Bible uses three interchangeable words, and I'm going to ask you to sit up here a little bit because we're getting into the dry part of the sermon, and you're going, wait, I thought we were already there, right? 
Sit up a little bit, take a deep breath. I, I need you to work with me on this one, okay? Uh, a, 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 an event, a speaking event like this, 75% of it any day of the week is up, is up to the listener, right? So I'm going to really need you to do your 75% here hard because this is a little technical, but it's important. This is important stuff here. So the Bible uses three interchangeable words to describe the role that these brothers are called to fill in our body. Most of the time we call them elders, which is a fine biblical word. The Greek word is presbyteros. You've heard of Presbyterians, the presbyter a Presbyterian form of church government. That's where, that, that's where that comes from, presbyteros. It emphasizes spiritual maturity. A second word is the word pastor. Uh, the Greek word is poimen, and it means shepherd. In most churches, that's what they call the preacher. They call the preacher the pastor. I don't even argue with people about that anymore. When I'm out, all of they go, you're a pastor. I go, yeah, there's no, not really worth trying to get into in just a casual conversation. But the biblical word, poimen, pastor, is always used to describe elders, not the preacher. Then a third word is the word episkopos, which is translated as overseer, or bishop, or guardian. There's a great passage. These, these uh, words are scattered all over the New Testament as they talk about uh, the elders, and as I said, they're used interchangeably. But there's a great passage where all three of them are used at the same time. Acts chapter 20. Um, Paul is in the province of Asia. He's headed for Jerusalem. He knows this will be the last time he will ever be in this part of the world. And so since he's nearby, he sends a message to a group of men, the elders in the church in Ephesus, and he says, I, I want you guys to meet me. I'm probably not going to be in this part of the world again. This is my last chance to see you, to talk to you. And so they get together. In verse 17, Acts chapter 20, it says, from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church, the word that Luke, who's the author of this story, Luke uses the word presbyteros, elders. And then in verse 28, Paul tells the elders, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit, remember we said earlier that, that leaders need God's Holy Spirit, Paul is touching that point right here, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, the word is episkopos, and then he says, be shepherds, poi men, be pastors of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. Now, each of those terms helps us understand something about who these men are supposed to be and how they are supposed to carry out their responsibilities. So I want to take each one of them and just unpack it real quickly here. The word elder is pretty clear. It suggests spiritual maturity. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that an elder is always older than you. Okay, so uh, the other day, well, not, not the other day, but a while back, not that long ago, I went to the doctor. And I'm in the, I'm in the waiting room, and the nurse comes in, and she does the uh, history and physical. And then a few minutes later, a teenager came in. And I said, hey, this is kind of awesome that they're letting teenagers intern in doctor's offices. It's got to be a great experience for you. And he was not amused, and he was not a teenager, that was the doctor, right? He was, and he was great. He was really, really good. He, was, he, he really helped me a lot. But the thing, it blew me away at how young he was. Elders are not always going to be older than you. Sometimes they're going to be younger than you. Um, age and maturity are not always found in the same person. But the word elder describes someone who has a long track record of faithfulness, what Eugene Peterson called a long walk in the same direction. Elder refers to somebody who's walked with God long enough that his soul has wrinkles even if his face doesn't. The word pastor or shepherd pictures the compassionate care that the elders are to give to a church. Shepherds see to it that the sheep, that's you and me, are fed, protected, and cared for when they're sick or injured. Elders have to be compassionate caregivers. They have to be vigilant protectors. They have to be responsible providers. Lynn Anderson years ago wrote a book 
on elders. It's called, they smell like sheep. Kind of says it all. They're, they're among their people. And then the last word, episkopos, is an, is a, is an interesting and it's a difficult word. Um, it appears only five times in the New Testament, and it's usually translated overseer. And when you hear that word, overseer, you may connect it with concepts, uh, some of them as benign as being the night manager at CVS, or as evil as a slave driver on a plantation. And when it's translated as bishop, the imagery gets even more problematic. So I want to go back to the original language in, the New Te- which, in which the New Testament was written and see what that word meant then to try and take some of the baggage off of it. One of the first places the word is used is in Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Zechariah is a priest, and he's the father of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. And so in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 68, Zechariah is praising God for the birth of his son. And here's what he says. He says, praise be to the Lord the God of Israel, because he has come. That phrase, he has come, comes from the word episkopos. It means he has come to visit his people. He has come near. So in in, in the word bishop or overseer or uh, episkopos is the idea of someone who is near. But the word also carries with it the idea of watching and knowing and seeing, overseer. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, which is a standard for biblical biblical word definitions, says that protective care is at the heart of the word overseer. Protective care. Carl Holliday is a friend of mine and chairman of the New Testament studies at Emory University. He says that the word episkopos cannot be divorced from the word shepherd. They go together. So let's, let's put those three words together, the three words that we've been working with, okay? We are looking for elders, spiritually mature men, men with wrinkled souls, who can shepherd this church, lead, guide, feed it. Men who will draw near enough to know us, care enough to watch over us, Love us enough to warn and protect us. Which means there may be times when they get up in our business a little bit. They might come alongside you or me sometime and say, hey, I love you. I'm worried about you. Can we talk? That's what elders, shepherds, overseers do. And frankly, that's a far cry from what we in the church think they ought to do years ago, and it would be worth studying this to figure out how this sort of evolved, but years ago, churches, particularly churches of Christ, and it's true in other uh, denominations as well, adopted a more Western corporate job description for their leaders. When we, think, when we thought about their role, we, 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 thought of an, we, we, we kind of thought of an official church board. We thought of, we thought of policy makers. We, we think they ought to be administrators of church programs. The Bible seems to say, though, that they are to be shepherds of the people, not administrators of programs. We think they ought to be like a spiritual board of directors. The Bible paints them as providers of protective care. We often want elders to spend their time in a conference room making decisions. The Bible seems to be describing men who mingle among the people making connections. We want them to manage. The Bible more often calls them to mentor. Being a leader in any kind of organization is a tough assignment. It's hard. Many of you are leaders in your businesses, in your schools, in your community. It's it's always hard to be a leader. On April 12th, 1945, Vice President Harry Truman was summoned to the White House. He was shown into Eleanor Roosevelt's sitting room where she told him the news that President Roosevelt had died. 
And Truman sat there for a moment, silently. And then he looked at Mrs. Roosevelt and said, is there anything we can do for you? And she smiled and she looked at him and said, no, is there anything we can do for you? You're the one in trouble now. Being a leader of God's people is one of the most important and difficult assignments any human can ever undertake. To find the right kind of leaders, we need God's perspective. They need God's spirit. So I want to again ask you to be in prayer about this. Some of you will be invited to consider this position and to be considered for it. And I know that's a huge risk. I know that's a scary thought. But our shepherds, the, the nine that we have right now, need more help. There are a lot of us and we're growing and they need more of us to step up and to take this position. So I want to close with a prayer. Let me invite you to stand as we pray and just ask God to bless this season and bless our hearing of his word. Father, we are desperately in need of your perspective in every, every area of life, in the way we view others, in the way we view our possessions, in the way even we view ourselves. But we're also in need of your perspective in terms of this need for leadership. And so we pray that we would see with your eyes, hear with your ears, speak with your words. We pray that your spirit would continue to rest on our current leaders in any that take up this mantle with them. We are grateful for our shepherds, for their wisdom, their humility, their integrity. Uh, we pray for them and their families. We pray your protection over them, that you would protect them from the evil one, from every physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, financial, professional assault he might make against them. That You would put a hedge of protection around our shepherds so that they can, in turn, lead, pastor, and protect us. Bless our church in this season of searching for new leadership. We pray that we will take it so seriously and diligently. And again, we ask for your eyes. God, we pray for people that are considering making Twickenham their church home. We pray that they would join us on this journey and that they would bring the gifts and talents your spirit has given them to bear in this church and in this community. We pray all of this in Jesus' name and the whole church said, amen. Light the fire in my soul, fan the flame and make me whole. Lord, you know where I've been, so light the fire in my heart again. Just a couple of things as we close. TCM Ministry, don't forget that you have a terrific Tuesday at Southern Adventures and that you have to have your camp applications in by Sunday, July the 2nd. So keep those things in mind. Uh, the 39ers, you've got a trip coming up. As always during the summer, we have dinner in a Devo. Tickets are available right outside as you leave today or you can call the church office and make a reservation. And we have um, nine teenagers. If you're going to Ecuador, raise your hand. That's not nine, that's two. They're downstairs. And 10 adults. If you're going to Ecuador, raise your hand. Adults. And we leave on Wednesday and come back on Wednesday. So keep those teenagers and adults and myself in your prayers as we travel down and uh, get to spend some time with the kids at the Hacienda. We're looking forward to that. As always, we hope you have a great week. And we're very, very glad that you were here. And we will close in prayer as Jim leads us. Father, we pray that you will give us your perspective this week. We pray that you will be with us and help us to dedicate everything that we do this week, whether it's cutting our lawn, whether it's tending children, fixing a meal, designing something for space that you will help us to dedicate it as a worship to you. We <clears throat> pray that you will be given the glory for all the good things that happened to us this week. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.